religious beliefs or lack of belief, you are welcome here. No matter your age, sex, sexual orientation or gender identity, you are welcome here. No importa tu ciudadanía, tu estás bienvenido aquí. No matter your citizenship, politics, or relationship status. No matter your physical characteristics or health, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, you are welcome in this place. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Montgomery Online Worship for September 20, 2020. I'm so glad that you could be with us this morning. Shana Tova. Happy New Year. I would like to invite you into this hour of worship with words spoken by Brittany Packnett Cunningham on MSNBC yesterday morning. I mean, what people have been saying is let her memory be a revolution, and I couldn't agree more. She would want us to fight just like she did. Now is not the time for cynicism. Now is the time to choose to take up our gifts and our talents and actually fight. Now is the time to make sure that we are engaging in every way possible to November and beyond November to protect the rights that we hold dear. I invite those who would like to do so to join me in speaking aloud our congregational covenant. We, the members and friends of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Montgomery, promise to serve our community with open minds, willing hearts, and helping hands as we respect one another, honoring that our perceptions may differ, value our differences, working to better understand them in conflict, give joyfully of ourselves being in harmony with our capabilities and embrace our connections with each other, nature, the global community, and the great mystery of life. And we will now hear from our coordinator of religious education, Roger Burdett, with A Time for All Ages. Good morning and welcome to Time for All Ages. Oh, 
I'm out here on an abandoned railroad track and there's a reason for that. I'm out here because last week we began learning a little bit about Ida B. Wells, who was quite the activist in her day. And she started her activism really on a train. Last week we briefly discussed the recent death of John Lewis, congressman and civil rights icon, who famously said, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. A hundred years before John Lewis lived, Ida B. Wells lived, and we discussed her life a little bit. She began her life of activism where she stood up. Actually, she began it when she was a teacher working with black students in Memphis. She spoke up against the conditions of the black students in their schools, and she got fired. Later on, she was on a train to Nashville from Memphis. She bought a first-class ticket, but she was forced to move because she was black. She stood up against that. She won her case, although that decision was later overturned by the Tennessee Supreme Court, but she had set her life in motion. She was an activist. Well, after the train incident, things really began picking up for Ida B. Wells as a person who stood up and said something and did something when she saw something that was not right. One of her friends and a couple of his friends were murdered. It was a lynching. At this point, Ida B. Wells picked up her journalism skills. She was skeptical about the reasons why people were saying that there were lynchings, and she began to investigate as a journalist. She investigated several lynchings and she put her findings in a pamphlet and in some columns in local newspapers. Her expose about an 1892 lynching really riled people up and a mob burned down her press in Memphis. After a few months, the threats got so bad that she moved to Chicago and that's where she met her husband. Ferdinand Barnett, he was a renowned African-American lawyer. They had four children, and her activism continued. She began to travel, and she began to focus her attention on women's voting rights. But she also maintained her focus on lynchings, and she traveled around the world, and she spoke against lynchings. This actually caused a problem for her in some ways but she still spoke up. A lot of the white supporters of women's voting rights did not like her talk about lynchings. They were willing to look away from lynchings. So that caused a division between Ida B. Wells and white women's voting rights activists. Nonetheless, she continued to speak up. Her insistence on speaking up against lynchings brought her ridicule, she was ostracized within the women's rights movement, but she kept speaking up. Later in her life, she began focusing her attention on urban reform in the growing city of Chicago. So through this short look at Ida B. Wells Barnett's life, I believe we can see she was a person who did something that John Lewis would have been really proud of. John Lewis said, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. So cool. We've seen what Ida B. Wells Barnett did. What about you? What about me? What are we doing to make things right, to make things better, to stand up against the wrongs in this world and there are plenty. And with that, I wish you a really great week. Be well, stay strong, love you, take care. As I mentioned, it is the new year in the Jewish calendar. Uh, the birthday of the world and so I would like to offer this reflection a poem by Marge Piercy entitled The Birthday of the World. 
on the birthday of the world, I begin to contemplate what I have done and left undone. But this year, not so much rebuilding of my perennially damaged psyche, shoring up eroding friendships, digging out stumps of old resentments that refuse to rot on their own. No, this year, I want to call myself to task for what I have done and not done for peace. How much have I dared in opposition? How much have I put on the line for freedom, for mine and others? As these freedoms are pared, sliced, and diced, where have I spoken out? Who have I tried to move in this holy season, I stand self-convicted of sloth in a time when lies choke the mind and rhetoric bends reason to slithering, choking pythons. Here I stand before the gates opening, the fire dazzling my eyes, and as I approach what judges me, I judge myself. Give me weapons of minute destruction. Let my words turn into sparks. Bashana, Bashana, Habana. O Tire, O Tire, Kamatori. Bashana, Bashana, Habana. Soon the day will arrive when we will be together and no longer will we live in fear. Children will smile without wondering whether on that day thunder clouds will appear. Wait and see, wait and see what a world there can be if we share, if we care, you and me. Wait and see, wait and see what a world there can be if we share, if we care. Some have dreams, some have died To make a bright tomorrow And their vision remains in our hearts Now the torch must be passed With new hope and not in sorrow And the promise to make a new start Wait and see, wait and see What a world there can be If we share We have a tradition in our fellowship, as in many Unitarian Universalist congregations, of honoring our joys and sorrows during the service. 
I would like to invite you to offer what is on your heart this morning. What are the things that you carry? What are the celebrations you have known this week? I want to celebrate the return home of Jim Smith, Nordis husband. I celebrate 35 years in recovery for all of those things that we celebrate, the birthdays, the anniversaries, the new beginnings, and for those things that weigh us down, the griefs and sorrows, the losses and injuries, the worries and anxieties. Of course, with the nation today, we grieve the terrible loss of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on Friday afternoon. We take this time to honor, to lift up, and release. Spirit of light, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion. Congregation has a practice of sharing the undesignated Sunday offering with an organization doing the work here in Montgomery on the ground that we are dedicated to in principle. The Social Action Committee selects uh, the organizations and for this quarter we are sharing 50% of the undesignated contributions with the Montgomery Pride United Emergency Resource Program. Earlier in the year, Thane Miles provided us with a video to talk about the work of Montgomery Pride United, and in particular, the Emergency Resource Project, of which he's been a part since its inception. Let's take a moment again to hear from Thane. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Montgomery Pride United, I'd like to say thank you for your continued support. Shortly after arriving in Montgomery, I was introduced to Montgomery Pride United, where I met the founders, Meta Ellis and Emma McDaniel, who were both so friendly, caring, loving, genuine, and warm. I knew from the start that we were kindred spirits and would get along just fine. As 2019 ushered in, I became increasingly involved with volunteer efforts and their day-to-day -day activities and issues that the organization faced. I feel good about being able to provide help, a listening ear, a chat, a hug, or any other number of ways that people often need to feel that they are heard, acknowledged, and validated. I help with taking in the many donations by receiving items such as clothes, appliances, home decor, jewelry, toiletries, art, etc all to be cleaned, repurposed, and priced for resale. We strive so hard to become ambassadors of our LGBTQ community by being present and active with understanding the concerns and needs that many are faced with from being rejected by family, friends, and displaced from their homes, losing their jobs, struggling with their identity, and in many cases, the inability to keep up with the day-to-day -day rising costs of healthcare and food. We at Montgomery Pride United are here to serve our local LGBTQ community. And in doing so, we have created a new program called the Emergency Resource Program, of which 
I'm a founding member of and its newly appointed program director. The Emergency Resource Program is designed to help those in the most need. We offer an array of services such as a food pantry, clothing, personal items, utilities when they are shut off, transportation to doctor's appointments, and assistance with paying medical and dental bills. We also partner with the Family Sunshine Center to help the LGBTQ members who disproportionately suffer from domestic violence and are frequently disowned by their families. Every donation can help expand our goals to service others. During COVID-19, if you would like to visit or drop off items, our hours of operation are Tuesdays and Fridays only from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Time. We can be found on Facebook and our address is 635 Madison Avenue, Montgomery, Alabama. Thank you. I'm so grateful that our congregation has been engaged with Montgomery Pride United uh, on an ongoing basis, and we are gratified and honored to have this opportunity to participate in the important work that they are doing. I hope that you will be as generous as you are able in making contributions if you use the donate link on our website or if you send us a check in the mail or electronically. 50% of anything that we receive that is not designated in the memo line as being for your pledge, 50% of it will go to that organization, uh, Montgomery Pride United, specifically for the Emergency Resource Program. So Friday was supposed to be a, a celebration day for me. It's the 35th anniversary of the beginning of my recovery, September 18th, 1985. And it was also the eve, the New Year's Eve of the Jewish calendar, Yerev Rosh Hashanah. A beloved fellow UU and fellow member of my recovery program stopped by with a surprise. She brought me my 35-year medallion. I knew it had been a rough week for Rabbi Scott Kramer and his congregation. In fact, it was a rough start to High Holy Days. As you may be aware, they were Zoom-bombed at the uh, service the previous week. Uh, with some really vile, disruptive messaging. And, and so it's, um, it's been an uneasy time, and they're having to take extra care to make sure that folks are safe. So I was looking forward to dropping in on the Friday evening service. Uh, despite my complete incompetence at Hebrew, I enjoy watching and listening to the the, the reverent pageantry, especially of the High Holy Days. And Rabbi Scott always has a word for me in, in his sermons. Uh, so, so planning on that meant that I needed to be free at 6 o'clock to have my sermon prep pretty much completed. So I'd spent most of the afternoon making sure all of the parts were lined up and and arranged. I was almost ready to send out notes to everybody that I needed to send me something so I could put it all together. And then as I was watching, a messenger notification popped up. Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And it isn't like losing a loved one when a key person in power dies, it's different. I lost my dad in March, my sister-in-law Ellen in April, my brother-in-law Edward just this month. And each one is a huge blow in its own way. But when it's a loved one, a family member or a close friend, the anguish is contained to the lives that are directly touched, right? We've had a lot of public loss this year, too. Joseph Lowry in March, 
C.T. Vivian and John Lewis in July. Those were public figures, but they felt really human to me. They were all men that I had had an opportunity to march with and chat with and share a laugh. Their deaths were awful and enormous, but still. None of those losses came close to the stakes that Ruth Bader Ginsburg held in the balance. Justice Ginsburg, in many ways, carried the hope of a desperate nation on her tiny and powerful frame. With Supreme Court decisions, when, when things held up, when, when matters before the court were decided in a way that, that felt like justice, that honored the laws and the ideals of our nation, we had her to thank. And when they did not hold, when something coming out of the court went terribly awry, We could always look to her, to her descent. Her writing could carry us through with, with her, her indignation and moral uplift. Uh, and I've wondered in moments whether it might feel different if I had enjoyed a chance at some point to share a coffee and a laugh with her, to relate with her as a human being. I don't know, but I doubt it somehow. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is and shall remain something of a god in my mind, not just for our nation, but for humanity. And on Friday afternoon, it felt like God was dead. I told Carolyn, this for me, this moment was my Kennedy assassination. I was alive when John Kennedy was shot, but I was too young to know. And all of my life I've heard stories of how it felt. Everything stopped. Phrases, words like debilitating, crushing, paralyzing, life shattering. Hope evaporating. More terrifying than 9-11. More jarring than the Challenger disaster. More disorienting for me than losing either of my parents. Friday, I felt lost. After I took a few breaths and made some coffee, got some ice cream and could sit still again. It was a few hours later. I knew the service that I had planned would have to wait for another day. Because I don't know what you need today. Maybe you need to tune out the world and hear cheery thoughts and pep talks. But what I feel is most necessary today is this. To consider the weight of this awful, incessant, progressive loss. Yes, that, but more than that too. Also, to consider how do we find hope? How do we build hope? How do we hold hope in this day? Okay, not just hope. That word is not enough. It's, it's too small. I don't want you to think I'm just trying to cling to the possibility of survival or that we will be okay down the road. That's there, sure, but, but it's much more than that what I'm talking about. For hope to have meaning right now, for it to actually sustain us, it must be partnered with or interwoven with courage, resilience, and love. Damn, that seems like an awful lot to ask right now. Huh? So,
let's first just take a moment to consider who was this remarkable life that was lost. Ruth Bader Ginsburg broke all sorts of barriers. I'm not going to give you a biography. The airwaves are full of biographies yesterday and today. If you don't know the story, I really encourage you to make sure you do. But what she accomplished in her own life is not nearly the whole story. So much of why she is so beloved and revered is the way in which she worked tirelessly to bring justice and equity to the lives of other people. For her, it began, of course, with equal justice for women. But throughout her life and career, she has seen areas of injustice and on each occasion spoken out. Immigrants, the accused, sexual minorities, religious minorities, anyone that she saw as being a target of oppression or marginalization. Even those two things together would not have made quite as remarkable a person and a life were it not for her amazing temperament, her insistence on respect and compassion for adversaries, her refusal to lose composure. So that as fierce as she was, and my God was she fierce, she was always also graceful. And that just imbued her presence with such power. <laughs> the loss is awful because for so many of us it feels as though she was the last real hope of maintaining an institution of justice in this country, even as much as it has been eroded by extremism, partisanship, and corruption, there was still the court, mostly. And as long as Justice Ginsburg was there, even when they didn't do the right thing, they would be held accountable on the record. So it's easy in this moment to feel fearful. What I want to say we need to do right now as a nation is acknowledge this pain, this loss, this, this gaping hole that she leaves. Name it. Sit in it. All of it. But, but be sure to have company. Don't be, don't be alone with it. Stay connected. This human connection is so desperately important right now. I want to encourage you to, to pray, whatever that means. If, if you think when I use that word I'm talking about addressing a far-off deity, then you don't know me as well as you think. We, we had a recent Wednesday evening program about prayer, what prayer is in Unitarian Universalism, and the scope, the range is virtually infinite. For many of us it is meditation. It may be sitting silent meditation or guided meditation. It may be meditative rituals or repetition. 
there are resources for meditation for those who have not had a practice. If you're not a yoga person or a, a, a person who regularly does sitting meditation, that is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do when it's unfamiliar. And so there, there are a number of resources out there to help. I'm not talking about those apps that you download where a soothing voice talks to you. I'm not, that's not, that doesn't do it for me. If it does it for you, great, but um, that's not the only thing that's out there. So I want to post some links on our Facebook page. Be sure and take a look. There's even uh, some, some good advice for meditation practices for children, like young children, like children who in no way would be able to sit still and meditate, and that's okay. Prayer, you see, in my mind, when I use the term, what I'm talking about is a full presence, an opening, a vulnerability, a humility, a receptiveness. So, so that might come in the form of meditation, active or sitting or something else. It might come as yoga, it might come as music, it might come through reading, dance, something else. But I encourage you to find a practice, a spiritual practice of some sort if you don't have one already. Uh, and have fun. You need to be sure you're having fun. That you're finding enjoyment that is not simply anxiety avoidance. Because in, in times of crisis and trauma, there is an automatic reflex to find things to fill the attention to avoid. Spiritual practice will help us to move past that into a space where we can actually have activities television shows and movies, music, physical activities, whatever it is uh, that, that brings fun to you, whatever sort of play you like. But play that is not simply an avoidance mechanism. Uh, spiritual practice helps us to get there. So make sure you're having fun. Make sure you're getting rest. This is an area where I have really struggled. Sleep is not coming naturally for me these days, and I can testify to how terribly important it is. Um, be sure and find beauty. Which is every bit as important as fun, but different because beauty allows us to engage with something outside of ourselves in a sense of appreciation, humility, and awe. Find beauty and take time for it. And here's another thing, this is a terribly important thing, and this is a thing that often gets lost in times of extreme anxiety like this. I'm watching it all around me right now. Be careful about this. Mourn only what is actually lost. Okay, hear me. Mourn only what is actually lost. Right now we are kind of caught up as a nation in, the, in, this, in this fear that, that democracy is dissolving. By the time the election comes, oh my God, we don't know if it's even going to be legitimate. And, and, and after the election, what will be left in January? Will there even... Look, mourn only what is lost. 
the power, the intellect, the grace, the skill, the passion and compassion of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Her death leaves a terrible hole. But all of those things that we imagine might come as a result of her absence, those losses have not occurred yet. And it is terribly important if we have to maintain our sanity that we not grieve in anticipation of what might be lost. Mourn only what is actually lost and refuse despair. Refuse despair. I know Brian Stevenson has this line about you know, despair is, is collaboration with the enemy. I'm sure that's not the right words, but you, you've heard it. And yeah, that's good, um, definitely true, but the trouble is that if you're feeling despair and you hear that, that's just shame, not especially helpful. We must refuse despair, and we have guides for this, because it was not that long ago that our world emerged from the most horrific genocide in global history. So let us look to the voices that come out of the Shoah, the Holocaust. Eddie Hillison, uh, who was killed in the Holocaust and whose voice continues to be a powerful beacon of encouragement and hope and faith and love. Victor Frankl, who did survive and published the book that was almost ready when he was taken to the camp, Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, when he was brought in, the manuscript, the entirety of it was destroyed, and he had to start over. And what came from starting over was such powerful insight from his experience in the concentration camps. James Luther Adams talked about him very recently. Unitarian minister went to Europe, met with, worked with, studied with many of the European ministers and organizers of the resistance, was himself uh, interrogated by the Gestapo. Um, so his voice has something to give us. And what might be interesting, if you remember those five smooth stones that James Luther Adams offered to us, the five smooth stones of liberal religion, the last one was hope, the persistence and insistence of hope as a core element of our religious tradition, that in spite of everything we've seen, there is nonetheless a confidence and assurance that the human spirit and human existence has the ability, the drive, the nature to emerge from this time. What's needed in this hour is attention to what is happening. Attention to the needs and yearnings of your own spirit. Attention to the well-being of people around you. Attention to what must be done 
in order to make real the promises carried in Unitarian Universalism. I opened with Brittany Pecknett Cunningham. Uh, she posted the following. I know the popular analysis is going to be, we're screwed, and I feel you. But nah, RBG didn't go out like that, and neither are we. I'm not speaking that, and I'm not believing that. we going to fight. That's what we're going to do. And yes, we Unitarian Universalists believe in the inherent worth and dignity of every person, believe in justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, believe in the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. These things remain true, and it remains true as Theodore Parker told us in the worst moments of the abolitionist movement. The moral arc of history bends towards justice. And as Martin Luther King Jr. reminded us in follow-up, that doesn't happen on its own time itself is neutral. And the oppressor uses time much better to their advantage. But we shall endure, provided that we remain in love, compassion, and connection in this hour. We can do this together. We can carry each other through. We've done harder things as human beings. This is not the darkest moment in history. It's a terrible loss to be sure, but all is not lost. Mourn only what is actually lost. Refuse despair. We shall overcome. But we gonna fight. That's what we're gonna do. May it be so. Stand up and make good trouble. Speak up and make good trouble. Get up and make good trouble. Rise up and make good trouble. Stand up and make good trouble. Speak up and make good trouble. Get up and make good trouble. Rise up and make good trouble. Stand up and make good trouble. Speak up. Make some noise. and make good trouble. Get up and make good make trouble. Rise up, make some and make good trouble. Never, never be afraid to make some noise. Make some noise. Never, never be afraid to make some noise. Make some noise. This is the struggle, the struggle of a lifetime. Makes good troubles. This is the struggle, the struggle of a lifetime. Make good troubles. This is the struggle, the struggle of a lifetime. And make good troubles. This is the struggle, the struggle of a lifetime. And make good troubles. Next week, we're going to honor new members. We're going to receive 
new members. We're going to recognize the dedication and generosity of leaders within our congregation. Come over to second hour. Come out on Wednesday night at 6.30. Come out for all of the stuff that's going on. You can find the information and the links on our website. Until then, our service has ended. May our service begin.